Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this Thanksgiving Eve service of worship. I pray the Lord will bless you and your family with his peace this Thanksgiving and that you will share your thanks to God with your family as you're gathered together tomorrow. Thank you for joining in for this time of praise and thanksgiving. Just on our own, we'll be gathering remotely to encourage one another to keep fighting the good fight. Our Sunday morning worship services for the next few weeks will be by live stream on Facebook from the Drakesboro United Methodist Church. And after the service is concluded, we will copy it over to my YouTube collection of services. So if you are uh, able, join us on Facebook at 9.30 a.m. Sunday morning or by 11 a.m. on YouTube. The YouTube is uh, yet to be done. I've never done it this way before, but I'll have Caleb with me that Sunday morning. We're, we are Caleb and uh, Jimmy, and I are going to gather at the church in Drakesboro, which has all been decorated and completed, and uh, we're going to hold our services for the first Sundays of Advent from there and then we will invite you to join us on Facebook for the live feed or YouTube later on. I probably should say that just to be safe. I'll continue to publish Bible studies and special services on Wednesday nights, and I'll post a Christmas Eve service uh, Thursday evening, December 24th, and a New Year's Eve service on Thursday, December 31st, I hope to have those special services posted by 6 p.m. And then beginning on Monday, um, December, no, November, uh, the first Sunday of Advent is this Sunday, the 29th. So I'll be posting those uh, brief Advent reflections every day of Advent beginning on Sunday and extending through the end of Advent, which would be Christmas Eve. And then we'll have our Christmas Day uh, as a day off. So the Christmas Eve service will be the last one that week. We'll have another special service Wednesday, or perhaps a Bible study Wednesday, and then the, uh, the next special service on New Year's Eve, uh, the Wesley Covenant service. So if you'll make plans to join me on those evenings, we'll have some really good material to supplement your uh, Advent and Christmas seasons. I hope that you are able to use these traditional resources as a way to keep your heart tuned in and turned toward the Lord through what will be this year a most unusual Advent and Christmas season may be in its own way just as hectic as usual, but uh, certainly unusual in some respects. My most important announcement is that God loves you as though you were the only one in the world for him to love. And had he not sent his one and only son to die for the sins of the whole world, he still would have sent him just for you because you are that special to him. He loves you that much. And because we have been loved deeply by the Lord our God, we are free to love one another. I pray that you will now be able to join in our service of worship. Let me get that settled there. And uh, first, let's have a call to praise and prayer from Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. And now if you will bow with me for our opening prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering in this way. We pray that you will assist us to come before you with our hearts full of gratitude and thanksgiving to worship you for all you are, for all you have done, and for all your promises for our future. We give you thanks and praise through the strong name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Here is a reading from the Old Testament, and if you will please turn in your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 through 18. If you're one of the teens who have been participating in memorizing the books of the Old Testament, you'll know that Deuteronomy is one of the very first five books of the Bible called the Law or the Pentateuch, but the, also known as the Books of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning with verse 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing up out of the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce, and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron, and you can dig copper out of the hills, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands and his laws and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, you, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms His covenant which He swore to your ancestors as it is today. And thus ends the reading from the Old Testament. If you don't have a hymnal, please sing all that you can of 131, We Gather Together. <whistles> dee, dee, dee. We gather 
gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens his will to make known. The wicked oppressing now cease from distressing. Sing praises to his name, he forgets not his own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining his kingdom divine. So from the beginning the fight we were winning, thou, Lord, was at our side, all glory be thine. We all do extol thee, our leader triumphant, and pray that thou still our defender wilt be. Let thy congregation escape tribulation. Thy name be ever praised, O Lord, make us free. Amen. A reading from the New Testament letters, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. That is the ending of our reading from the New Testament letter, 2 Corinthians. Our next hymn is a thanksgiving hymn, 694, Come, Ye thankful people, come. <laughs> da 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 starts here. Come, ye thankful people, come, raise the song of harvest home. 
all is safely gathered in ere the winter storms begin god our maker doth provide for our wants to be supplied come to god's own temple come raise the song of harvest home all the world is god's own field fruit a praise to god we yield wheat and tares together sown are to joy or sorrow grown first the blade and then the ear then the full corn shall appear lord of harvest grant that we wholesome grain and pure may be for the lord our god shall come and shall take the harvest home from the field shall in that day all offenses purge away giving angels charge at last in the fire the tares to cast but the fruitful ears to store in the garner evermore even so lord quickly come bring thy final harvest home gather thou thy people in free from sorrow free from sin there forever purified in thy presence to abide come with all thine angels come raise the glorious harvest home amen and now a reading from the psalms psalm 65 verses 1 through 13 this is the whole of Psalm 65. Praise awaits you, our God in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds. God, our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water in it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. You drench its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty, and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow, the hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. And that is the end of our Psalm 65. Our affirmation of faith is the Nicene Creed found in your hymnal on 8 
80. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission, sorry, for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and of the life in the world to come. Amen. Before we move on, uh, there are a couple of phrases that need a little more attention. We said we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, which means the one holy universal and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now a prayer of intercession. Together, let us pray for the people of this congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who suffer and those in trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the concerns of this local community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the world, its peoples, and its leaders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the church universal, its leaders, its members, and its mission. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the newly infected with COVID-19 coronavirus in the U.S. and for the newly infected around the world. Let us pray for those who have died in our country from COVID-19 coronavirus, and for all who have died around the world. 
Let us pray for those who have been deceived and can no longer acknowledge the truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The gospel lesson is taken from the gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. This passage appears to be a simple healing account, but as we will see, this account turned out to be about only one man, the thankful Samaritan leper no more. The miracle contains two levels of tension. The first is that Jews, of whom Jesus and the Apostles all were Jews, disliked Samaritans. Their history goes back many more centuries than I'll be able to talk with you about this evening, but Samaritans believed they were the true descendants of Israel and keepers of the Torah. During the time of the New Testament, their chief religious site was Mount Gerizim. The Samaritans believed that the Jerusalem temple and priesthood were illegitimate. I thought they took their name from the city of Samaria, but no, though their name is similar to the city of Samaria, the Samaritans took their name from the phrase keeper of the law, which is what they were. It's in Hebrew, Shem, Shemrim, Shemrim in Hebrew. And the other point of tension was that these ten were lepers. They were shunned by society. There were many Levitical laws that told them how they should behave and what they were to wear and 
very strict laws governing their behavior, they would not have any proximity to healthy people. We think the six-foot rule is very hard to keep. Just imagine if you were a leper, how far you would have to stay from people. Now the miracle, their healing, is told in two parts. The miracle itself, verses 11 through 14, and the Samaritans' efforts to return thanks to Jesus and to praise God from verses 15 through 19. Now if we included a third part, it would be Jesus' response and the lesson for us in verses 17 through 19. So you might consider that the passage has three parts rather than two. It takes place in the journey section of Luke. Now you may be surprised to learn that there was a journey section or a journey narrative in Luke. It begins in chapter 9 with verse 51 and extends all the way through chapter 19, verse 48. So as we read in chapter 17, we're getting toward the end of the journey section of Luke. Now let's return again to this miracle. It is not like most miracles. The healing itself is not emphasized as much as the reaction to it. As with all five miracles that Jesus performed in the journey section, this miracle is less important than what happens as a result of it, what the response is. Well, let's take a look at the other four miracles just to see. In Luke 11, verses 14 through 28, we have Jesus driving out a demon. And the unusual result or reaction is, they say Jesus must be working for the prince of demons. Well, that's unusual, isn't it? And then the second miracle in this journey section, Luke 13, verses 10 through 17, where Jesus is healing a crippled woman on the Sabbath. And as you can expect, the reaction was bad. The woman was crippled for 18 years, but the critics focus on how wrong it was to heal someone on the Sabbath. And when we come to chapter 14, the third miracle, Luke 14, verses 1 through 6. Jesus is healing a man whose whole body was badly swollen. And again, the reaction, the Pharisees and experts in the law remained silent. You wonder if that's another one of those situations where there were rocks in the ground that were practically crying out in praise and the religious leaders around Jesus at that moment remained stone silent. A very strange reaction. When we have this story that we're reading, Luke 17 verses 11 through 19, the healing of leprosy, Jesus asks the question, where are the other nine? What happened to them? Where did they go? Is this the only one who returns to give thanks? Our fifth miracle is in Luke 18, verses 35 through 43. A blind beggar receives sight. And Jesus says, What do you want for me to do for you? An unusual question for a blind man. But he he does follow by saying, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And it goes on to say, Immediately 
he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God, causing others to praise God. Jesus heals as he continues his journey to meet his fate in Jerusalem. Now that sounds very grim, and if you recall, what's going to happen in Jerusalem is truly pretty grim. But as far as the notes of the journey, Luke often records these notes of the journey in progress, but the notes become more frequent closer together the closer they get to Jerusalem. Jesus is passing between Samaria and Galilee in our story today, or this evening, moving east to west, his journey of destiny continues. That he would meet a Samaritan along this path is not at all unusual or surprising. Jesus' journey to Jerusalem is this progress or this trip that they make, he makes with his disciples toward Jerusalem to that day where he knows he will give himself as a sacrificial lamb. Luke calls it something a lot more um, cheerful and final. He calls it Jesus' time to be taken up to heaven as in 9, chapter 9, verse 51, he says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. There are other notes that Luke makes along the journey, and I just encourage you to see if you can find them. One is Luke 9, 51. Another is Luke 13, 22 and 33. You'll find another in Luke 14, another in Luke 17, another in Luke 18, and a few in Luke 19. The New Testament mentions a considerable number of journeys on foot, which is the journey, one of them, that we're talking about today. Mary journeyed from Galilee to Judea to visit Elizabeth. The baby Jesus was born in Bethlehem during the census. Mary and Joseph had traveled together uh, from Nazareth. Jesus was brought to Jerusalem to comply with the Jewish purification law. So far, these three trips were made from Nazareth to Jerusalem, a distance of about 70 miles from the time of Jesus' conception to Mary's purification. Fourth, the annual Passover visit was made by Joseph and Mary. Other journeys are mentioned, and Jesus himself walks to Jericho from Galilee and also to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He was in Samaria more than once. And then this note, his last journey to Jerusalem by means of Jericho and up through the hills to Jerusalem is, is the one that we are speaking of. And then the final one we'll, we'll mention this evening is his last journey after the resurrection, that journey to Emmaus. Jesus' final walk to Jerusalem from Capernaum was about a hundred miles or so, basically a five-day walk. And as he walked, he taught. Leading up to our portion of Scripture today, after having a run-in with the Pharisees, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, Do not be like the Pharisees. Don't be so difficult and dismissive of little ones and sinners. Don't you dare do anything that would cause one of these little ones to stumble. That's chapter 17, verse 2. Don't be faithless 
if another disciple sins, correct him or her. And if they repent, forgive them. Show good faith to them and keep on forgiving them. That's in chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. And then the last, don't be so hung up on status and recognition like the Pharisees were. Instead, think of yourselves as slaves, having no status and desiring no recognition. A slave wouldn't expect to be honored or thanked for doing what he or she was told. You are to be exceptional. When you have finished everything you've been ordered to do, say, We are worthless slaves. We have done only what you taught us, or only what we ought to have done. That's in chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. And then we come to, to chapter 17, verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Jesus wasn't afraid of meeting a Samaritan person along the way. He crossed all kinds of boundaries as he walked the earth and talked with his disciples. And verse 12, as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Verse 14, when he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus saw them. He saw them physically, but Jesus also saw them in their current state the spiritual need that was present in them. Jesus saw them. He told them what to do, and all ten responded in faith. But wait, Jesus had told them, go show yourselves to the priests, but he didn't tell them which temple they should go to. Jerusalem was the holy place for Jews, and Mount Gerizim was the holy place for Samaritans. But before we can begin guessing about that, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. The one leper now healed returns throws himself at Jesus' feet in worship, praising God and giving thanks to Jesus. And Jesus didn't say, I'm sorry, we have to get straightened out which temple you need to go to for worship. I'm God and I'm going to Jerusalem. No. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The thankful Samaritan leper, no more, found in Jesus what you and I found in Jesus. He found the very presence of God. He found that he was known and loved by God. He found his belief rewarded with healing. He found that God really cared for him, and he had to go back to the one who made all these discoveries possible, the one in whom he found all this goodness and presence. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Master, we come to you on the evening before Thanksgiving to catch some of the gratitude and thanksgiving we see here. We thank you for making your presence known to us. We thank you for knowing us completely and for loving us unconditionally. 
we thank you that every movement of faith and belief in you is met with your fantastic encouragement and care. We thank you that you really care so much for us. Help us to be centered in you, not distracted by all the holiday stuff. Lord, we are too often distracted beyond any sense of you. Forgive us, Lord, and assist us as we seek you this weekend. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'd like to remind you, please, to send your offerings to Jerry and Caleb. And uh, since we won't be back in the sanctuary until Sunday, December 20th, I ask you to send your offerings for the United Methodist Homes for Children and Youth also to Caleb and Jerry. Let's together sing the doxology where we praise God for all he has made us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Our final hymn as we celebrate Thanksgiving is 102. Now thank we all our God Ba, ba. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices, who wondrous things has done in whom this world rejoices who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today oh may this bounteous god through all our life be near us with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us and keep us still in grace and guide us when perplexed and free us from all ills in this world and the next all praise and thanks to God, the Father now be given. The Son and Him who reigns with them in highest heaven. The one eternal God, whom earth and heaven adore, for thus it was, is now, and shall be evermore. Amen. Thank you again, my friends, for joining in this act of worship. I pray that you have felt the presence of God and know his blessing. And now receive this benediction. May God bless you, brothers and sisters. May Christ keep us in the faith until the day we shall appear before his presence. Amen. <laughs>